Hey everyone, Greg Watson here, freelance writer, player of games, writer of words, recorder of videos, and tabletop role-playing aficionado. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Bye Bye Weekly Behind the Scenes DM only live stream, crafting the deep in which I build right and prepare for our next session of Call from the Deep. If you are playing characters Gotwald, Max, Sabra, or Twirl, this is not meant for you, but for the rest of you, welcome. Of course, there will be lots of spoilers. We stream our D&D sessions live on YouTube every Friday. You can join our official Discord server with invite link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel, please check out patreon.com slash roguewatson. For our campaign, we use Roll20. And for streaming, I use OBS Studio. I have had so many sessions now talking about... There are so many crafting sessions or streams talking about this one next episode. Because if you think about it, last week, we had to pivot at the last minute. So last week's Monday stream was also for this session. And then we've had... This week's is all going to be about this next session. And then I think I had one on spring break week for us. Which also had a Monday stream of crafting for this session. It's been crazy. We've had so much time. I fear we've almost had too much time to prepare for this session. But I guess it's good because, uh, you know, with a new, a whole new quest arc beginning, I mean, that's a lot to have to talk about and go over. And honestly, the more that I look at uh, this dungeon design, the more I realize I'm going to have to change things. <laughs> Stop me if you heard that before. Eric, why don't you just make your own damn dungeon, your own damn campaign? Uh, with blackjack and hookers. Well, don't tempt me. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. I think we can use it. Um, uh, I, we, we, I, I want to frame it as still like a stealthy infiltration mission of a main villain lair. I think we can pull that off. But if we do that then I don't know if the first level is actually where you want the players to go. And also, if you're suggesting they do an infiltration mission, then who the hell is going in the main front door? Right? <laughs> so the main entrance is on uh, the first level. The main entrance into the non-underwater part is like this long bridge causeway that's supposed to be, I think, attached to another island. I don't know if this picture is representative of what we're looking at here. So I thought there was supposed to be a bigger island instead of this weird bridge overlooking this like rock jutting thing here. But and then this right here, this kind of ledge that leads into the this crazy island thing is supposed to be this entrance here, which is heavily guarded as it should be by the enemy. So if you're gonna infiltrate the main bad guy layer, why are we using the main entrance? So these are the kind of things I'm thinking about. Now there are two other entrances that we can use. Uh, they're both on level three. They're both very, very underwater. I believe like 80 feet underwater. Uh, one below I assume, yes, yeah, it's north to south. So one is 80 feet below this first original entrance, sunken underwater, and the other one is 80 feet below, and then on the opposite end of the island. That would be a smarter move. Now, one of them is absolutely filled with bad guys. In fact, I will show you the hilarious... Um, we're just going to have to use the original artwork. Um, shout out to Bear Gardner, patron, who is... Uh, Providing me with some maps uh, still. I currently only have level 1 available, so we're going to have to use the old map for level 3. But uh, if we scroll down to that bottom, which for some reason the top and bottom are 60 and 61. I don't know. They're so separated yet. They're numerically right there. Look at all these tokens in area 60. <laughs> uh, I think this is supposed to be the barracks and like the main like staging ground where they, uh, you know go in and out there's like a whole gate system here you can see even on this map there's like a, a chain thing on the inner and outer side where they can raise and lower the gate and just have like hordes of enemies uh spill out of it it's area 61 i think nope area 60 a temporary barracks north of the entrance i don't know if that makes any sense because that's north is this way would it be south of the entrance i checked the i checked the compass uh, occupants include 45 Sawagan, 10 Sawagan Coral Smashers, 7 Sawagan Champions, 4 Sawagan Deep Divers, and 2 Sawagan Wave Shapers, and a Partridge in a Pear Tree. Sawagan in this area are socializing, performing drills, or resting in the seaweed bed. 6 Shell Sharks 
also swim in the cavern and close to the roof of the natural area. What is a shell shark? A word that I don't want to say too often with the alliteration. Uh, it's just a stronger hunting shark, I guess. With magic resistance. That's interesting. Shark's got magic resistance? Shell shark does, I guess. Blessed in a ritual during which plates of shell and coral permanently affix their bodies. Okay. Stronger than the average shark. Fair enough. So, yeah. And it's got a gate uh, that bars. Basically, this is not a sneak in there entrance. It's a, oh shit, everything has gone down. There's chaos. Maybe they can escape out this way. But this is like where all the different patrols come in and out of. It's just not a very usable entrance. So that leaves us with one entrance that is not guarded at all and actually makes for a pretty great infiltration, I think. Although it's all written and described as if the players never find it from the outside and instead find it from the inside, which I found kind of interesting. I tried to look over and see if there were any notes on like just getting inside this place that's not the top entrance. And so this is area, uh, well, the top one is area 61, which doesn't have any information whatsoever. The passage opens in a small chamber, and the opposite side another passage leads out of the room. Well, fantastic. Yeah, out of the room is like out of the entire dungeon complex. Like I feel like this needs to be highlighted more. Old guard post. The room and nearby passages have not been altered by the Sawagan, they're roughly hewn from rock and display none of the precision that characterizes Sawagan construction. I, I, there's so there's no information about why this opening like leads out from what I can tell, right? I wonder if the hand the maps that they get actually include these. Yeah, they do. See, that's interesting. So the players should know this knowledge, I think, based on the little crude handout drawings they get. It looks like both of those, you can't see when I blow it up because my overlay is covering it, but you can see there's like an opening here at the bottom. This is the big barracks room. And then it goes all the way to the top. And it almost looks like there were supposed to be, okay, it shows the stairs in the upper and upper left, which is true on level three. And then like whatever this is supposed to mean. But like definitely like long tunnel door door and then kind of opens up there. So I guess maybe it used to be stairs going, because this all used to be above water. All this stuff used to be, which is why a lot of people are confused about this dungeon that I've seen on like Reddit and stuff. They're like, why is this dungeon underwater? Like it doesn't seem to have any of the, it doesn't make sense to be underwater. It's like, well, that's because it wasn't initially underwater. Like this was a lizard folk layer that was just a cave dungeon that was magically sunken underwater by the Sawagan, which is why it's not doesn't look or feel like an underwater dungeon, but it just happens to be completely flooded with water. So that kind of answers that question. But there's still kind of a lack of information about uh, this entrance in particular. And then when you get down here, this is a prison cell, which is interesting that they can immediately get their way into uh, this area. You yeah, had the sneaky entrance long forgotten. Like it's not covered at all. And it almost like it, it kind of makes sense that it would be forgotten because, well, we'll go into this description here. Let's go to room, which by the way, I'm just talking about the dungeon here. We can go back and talk about the, the, the events leading up to going into this dungeon, but I also feel like we've kind of done it to death by now, right? We talked about the a Sawagan encounter, which I can go over uh, leading in here. Try to paint the fact that the area is like heavily patrolled by Sawagan. You can't even get near it. And even trying to get to Thornwatch. I don't want to repeat myself with like, oh, you got to like break a blockade and like get your way into the, because we just did all that with Neverwinter. Um, but still be like, it's a very dangerous, hostile area with like Sawagan with giant sharks and shit just constantly in the area to where you, you can't get near this location normally, which should motivate the players to then seek out the lizard folk who had been ousted here. They're, they've been now kicked out into the swamp, the mayor of dead men's swamp, which will lead to at least another kind of fun combat encounter. So that's all going to be probably in this session. So we're still got, we're, I don't think we're actually going to make it to, uh, this dungeon, um, tomorrow I, I would be I, in fact I'm, I'm certain we won't there's there's just no way with all the I've got two kind of combat encounters planned they could go pretty quick but even if whatever we decide to do I'll probably end it before we make it to the actual uh, dungeon but now I'm worried I need to get the third level map before the I need to get level three possibly before I get the level two map because I'm thinking about you know the first thing I need to think about with this dungeon is like how do the players get in and that's when I've been trying and that's when I suddenly came up with all these problems of like oh wait level one 
the main entrance like doesn't make any sense because it's heavily guarded and that's the main entrance like why would you use that to sneak into any location um you know other or you do some kind of weird ruse that like draws all the guards out or something which part of the idea is the players you know they'll have an infiltration mission and i'm thinking they can work with the lizard folk and maybe even the folks at thorn thorn hold i think he's in thorn one i think it's thorn hold to provide a overall distraction that should draw a lot of the Sawagan patrols away to even let them get near the dungeon but then my thing is like well now that they're at the, that that just gets them to the dungeon but then how do they actually get inside without just you know aggroing everything or or just busting down the doors and fighting room to room which i don't think is how this is supposed to be i really want this to be a, a more interesting stealthy you know infiltration thing and i think that's what's going to make this uh dungeon crawl uh particularly memorable and and different also we're going to look at this in a second but the first level kind of sucks i don't understand it's almost it's got like I don't know, like uh, 20 rooms and like 15 of them are, are completely empty with nothing in there. I don't, I don't understand, but all right, let's, let's stick to this room right here. So this is, this is the one area I was thinking, okay, this could be a possible secret entrance, although it puts them very, I don't know, like you're going from zero to 60 when it comes to this dungeon, like the arena's right here. It's, it's kind of crazy. Um, maybe they'll avoid the arena, hopefully. All right, so room. So this, again, this area that has no information on this old guard post, which is not like forgotten about by the Sawagan, leads to this tunnel area, which so great infiltration wise. And you actually come into this broken prison cell room. So this area 50 is broken down into multiple sub cells because each cell has something going on. This is the, what is it called? Nope, not Champion's Armory. Uh, does room 50 not have its own room? Oh yeah, there it is. Torture Chamber and Dungeon. Classic. Always need one of those. Uh, long room has five doors. Uh, secured from this side with metal bars. Instruments of torture. Three Sawagan are currently stretching a fish-like humanoid on the rack, which is a lovely, lovely fish dude named Borgus, uh, who is a Lokatha, who uh, I'm not sure if these exist in uh forgotten realms can somebody help me with that is this a gray hawk thing like i don't know why we need so many different kind of fish creatures <laughs> i guess not everybody has to be koato or anything but uh he's adorable looking i kind of love him but also i could replace him with a koatoa and use my uh like merfolk or a murloc voice from like warcraft which could be kind of fun uh stat block wise i think it's pretty similar to koatoa Anyway, he's been captured by the Sawagan. I don't know why they're... Per I, I could I maybe use like a lizard. I, they'd have to be breathed underwater. They would have some kind of thing to be able to uh, survive. Because at this point, they're completely underwater. Um, there's some Sawagan here. Three Sawagan champions, which is kind of crazy. These are not quite as powerful as the Barons. Um, CR3, they do have triple attack and blood frenzy. They're kind of like a mid-level boss. But still, 70 hit points. That's a lot to throw at the players right here so i might have to adjust that a little bit if that's like their first thing into the dungeon basically um and then each of the some of these rooms are occupied there's another person they can find so there, there's there's this fish dude and then there's a uh, triton named kish which i could maybe tie to like the harley character they have right now it may be uh it's her brother or her boyfriend or her father or something uh you know maybe he was captured bringing the information that they that that, that this happened basically that Sawagan took over lizard folk and maybe he was captured and that so she's got like a personal stake in it could be interesting uh but he's rotting in this room 50 d yeah the triton cell has been stripped of possessions and he says he'll join the party uh as an npc which we haven't actually had a whole lot of this campaign i don't think we, we there's people on their ship but so far they haven't actually had a whole lot of npcs with them unlike uh tomb and to some extent, Rhyme, but Rhyme, it was, I guess I didn't use too many on Rhyme. I feel like just towards the end, there was a lot. They kind of, because they came back. The clock goes forward this weekend in the UK. Oh, interesting, uh, Captain Mike. Ours did it like two weeks ago, I think. It's weird how people can just kind of decide time. <laughs> Isn't that fucking weird? We have, the, what, what's the weirdest thing is that Daylight Savings in the States is literally by state and there is at least one it might only be arizona i can't remember there may be another one we're literally they're like now nah, we don't fucking do daylight savings <laughs> like that's so fucking weird 
It's like, no, we don't we don't recognize this this whole time change bullshit. Like, okay. <laughs> I if I, I would love it if it if we stayed on like the summer one specifically because I am a night owl. I like being out in the evening and still having some light. Uh, I don't care about morning sun needing to be up too early, so screw all that. A large rock blocking the back of the cell too. Yes, Refus, I am getting to that as well. Lokathal, we're part of a special release as a fundraiser, I think, and are in the Forgotten Realms. Seen in one of the early chapters of Salt Marsh. I had no idea. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I, I don't I mean we could use it. I don't I guess I don't have any problem with just introducing a random fish. Because Lokathal don't exist, haven't really existed in my games or don't have anything to do with it, but this artwork is kind of selling me, right? It just looks like a Almost like a catfish, but like with legs and feet, very murloc looking. Like, I don't know, he's kind of adorable. So uh, I may have to use him just as a unique kind of very, very rare creature type. Just Randall. I don't know why they're fucking with him. Does it say like why this character is important? Or are they just cool assholes? Uh, I think he's in room 50 proper torture chamber. Uh, Lokoth on the rack is named Borges. He can speak common as well as Aqua and he has no possessions. He's very grateful to the characters they rescue him and eager to accompany him for the rest of the adventure. It's weird that there are two NPCs in the exact same area that they can rescue and then have the party accompany. That's the only thing I don't necessarily like. I wish they were spread out a little bit more. I think there is another dungeon somewhere, maybe? I don't know. I'd have to figure that out. But it'd be weird, in other words, if one of their main uh, plot points... Oh, Hawaii doesn't do daylight savings. Okay, maybe that's the other one. Um... It'd be weird if one of their one of their main plot points in this dungeon is to rescue people. And I think it would be weird pacing wise if they snuck into the dungeon and the first room they came across is the dungeon room with the people they need to rescue. I, that feels a little too much for me. But maybe it's they find the dungeons, but like a lot of the people are in the arena or you know are kind of spread out around the dungeon a little bit more, so that would give them their bearings. It would be useful to give them an NPC ally useful who at least knows some things about the swagon uh, i assume people can just talk underwater if they have the ability to breathe underwater so i, I think that we can bypass that thing Borges does say he can speak common also uh and so yeah the the broken one let's see apparently i think the c what's weird is there are two both of these npcs have like creature allies also the sea lion belongs to the triton who is still alive but the giant sea eel belongs to Borgus, the Lokoth, who is not still alive. It died, apparently, in the cell. And in its death throes, let's see, the thrashings. Oh, here it goes. When the Swagan first took over the fortress, the area was much smaller, though a passage led north to the second entrance to the fortress of this level. But that's not what the map shows. The map shows it being an entrance to the outside. That's interesting. If I go to level one, does it show? Because on this, it does look like there's... Oh, sorry, on level three. It does look like there were stairs icon here. So I'm going to first talk about the fortress. The area was much smaller, though a passage led north to the second entrance. Uh, led north to the second entrance of the fortress on this level. Oh, so the, no, that is correct. The, yeah, the entrance the entrance to the fortress is this level. Okay. The Sawagan decided they no longer need this entrance, so they did know about it, and they blocked off the passage. Why did they decide they no longer need this entrance? So they blocked off the... Wouldn't, wouldn't an underwater entrance be more convenient for them? I guess they have the back one of the barracks. They blocked off the passage by leaning a stone slab up against the north wall of this cell. Okay, so they do know about it. They just blocked it off. And then this sea eel, uh, the thrashings of the giant eel and its death throes have partially dislodged this slab. So if a character enters the room, a small and it's always described like they're finding it and not coming in the other way. A small opening is discovered in the north wall. Now that the slab has been moved, it is easy to open the passage up completely beyond the passage the guard room still exists in the original dimension, so the entrance is now 70 feet of water. I thought it was 80, but I guess it doesn't matter too much at that point. Borges is notably upset to discover the death of his companion, and the discovery makes him even more determined to get revenge on the Sawagan. That'd be kind of a sweet thing. 
No. <laughs> a lot of fun with that character voice. A great many operators are lost from this information. Yes, exactly. They enter the water prison. You could have a prisoner tell the PCs about air breathing prisoners being held elsewhere. Yes. I I, I mean I there is it's very useful to have a prisoner um an NPC near the beginning of a dungeon that can kind of impart some useful information. So that would so I'm looking at this as maybe my my entrance to this dungeon versus what I was doing initially, which was looking at level one and trying to parse out, okay, here's how they enter and I'll do this, because this feels like your infiltration entrance, does it not? Now, granted, that means the party would have to immediately set up all of their water breathing stuff to get inside. And it may even be very dangerous because obviously the Swaggen are more dangerous underwater in terms of getting close to the base. So they could still maybe get, you know, as close as they can on the top of the water or maybe like just under, I don't know. And then have to go down like, yeah, 70 or 80 feet, whatever it was, and then enter this dungeon. But this feels more like your, your infiltration path uh, to get inside this dungeon. And then you end up... Now, the problem is the lizard folk... Um, I, they would know about this entrance. They would not necessarily know that the Sawagan, uh I don't know if this was always a torture dungeon chamber or whatever, like turned into a prison. Because it feels where the entrance would lead into a prison cell. So clearly this, this hadn't, this couldn't have always been the case, right? You wouldn't have a, like a secondary entrance just enter into your prison cell. So this must have been a, a just a center room that they turned into another cell or something. Because otherwise it doesn't really make any sense. But how much would the lizard folk know that like this is the right way to get in versus the back way is clearly not the way to get in because it's covered. Maybe they can at least report the fact that they see, you know, patrols and troops. Maybe they've done some scouting themselves and they've seen uh, a lot of coming and goings out of the rear end of the dungeon versus the top end because obviously Sawagan so used that. But they would say, but, you know, and, and yeah, it's literally like the Star Wars scene near the end where it's like the many Bothans die to bring us this information, but we've got, uh, you know, there, there is one way to maybe infiltrate inside. And the, and the main reason the lizard folk haven't done this is to clean up my plot hole there is that lizard folk can't breathe underwater for more than 15 minutes. And they're like, we can't, you know, this the only way we could be able to get inside in any way, even with a strike mission would be going into this entrance, but it's already heavily underwater and we would not make it far before we'd run out of air and we do not have the kind of magical supplies or abilities to get much further than that. And unfortunately, Thorn Hold, the nearest, you know, castle area or whatever, uh, has kind of refused to be able to help. And maybe Thorn Hold is also on their back foot because of the Sawagan taking over the area and like destroying maybe whatever, you know, Navy presence they had. And they're just kind of there trying to keep the Sawagan from expanding at least onto land at that moment, but they're unable to come out and deal with the the fact that this layer has been taken over by the Sawagan. Hidden path to Red Branch Hideout. Oh, like the hidden path to Red Branch Hideout in Last Month of Fendover, it's there, but I've never seen. Really, never heard seen party entering that way. I, you know, I was going to ask, uh, Michael, if any of you have experience with Ghosts of Saltmarsh with this specific module of Final Enemy, and how you deal with entering this dungeon. It just, it doesn't sit well with me to go with level one, right? Like, I keep clicking on the map. That's not the right map, sorry. <laughs> I click on the lizard folk map. Uh, it's under the mission begins, which is confusing because it's also Swagon level one. But this opening entrance, north entrance and guard post, um... During the day, the doors are barred on the inside. At night, the doors are unbarred, and so we can use the doors to access the causeway and enter the marsh. Yeah, so what is it? I don't get that. Is it? It's not connected by land, though. The Swagan guards in Area 1 are overconfident. They don't keep a close eye on the causeway, which is bizarre. It's your only entrance, <laughs> at least on land. As long as characters approach the doors quietly, they do not alert the guards beyond. Tampering with the doors will alert... And, but again, this... This is assuming the Swagan are not out patrolling or doing anything. They're all just holed up in this dungeon. So, which is what I'm changing in my campaign is making them a much more active threat that makes it a base of operations that they're like patrolling around and going on maneuvers and just, you know, it's a whole enemy base thing. It wouldn't be just everybody holed up in their fucking cave. 
Uh, the guards can be tricked into opening doors and Swagat intelligence is high. This will not be an easy task. Character you meet with the Swagat makes a DC 18 charisma check. Convinces the doors to open the... Convinces the guards to open the doors for the party. That's fucking stupid. <laughs> uh, you will let us in. The doors are not magically locked to open to the appropriate spells or enough brawn. Can be forced on by character. Makes an athletics check. Da, da, da. Several Sawagan glare at you as they move to attack. Yeah, you just open the door. And there are... Well, I mean, let's go to that first level map. No, I haven't populated the this level yet. So I'm thinking maybe I need to work on the third level and instead of the first one. So here's what the opening salvo looks like. Six Sawagan, two Coral Smashers, and one Champion, which is, I think, their standard patrol. The Coral Smashers are... Slightly stronger than the average Sawagan. I think the average one still has, or the base stat block still has multi attack and the uh, blood frenzy, though, right? Yeah, two melee attacks. Average of 22 hit points, AC of 12. Uh, the Coral Smasher has more AC and more hit points. CR1 does more damage to objects and structures and is equipped with a Warhammer, which is a stupid ass weapon to try to wield underwater, in my opinion. Um,. Think maybe it should have some kind of different whatever good underwater siege weapon would be just like a harpoon or something almost just for stabbing into things like the way you can destroy objects uh is making them leak <laughs> i'm picturing boats is mainly what they do uh, and then we've already seen what the champion is a more stronger triple attack that's a lot of enemies just sitting there at the guard though that doesn't feel like an infiltration mission uh, if they just waltz into the entrance and kick down the door and just immediately fighting guys. This is not the theme that I'm going for. I don't want to go for this big room-to-room -room dungeon crawl. And plus, it's bizarre because they fight this big battle. You can easily, semi-easily, have Sawagan, like, escape, like, witness this and start running through the dungeon and alerting all the rest of the Sawagan that, like, hey, there's enemies here. We need to go kill them and be on high alert. And then your whole stealth infiltration mission has already gone tits up and now you're just in a dungeon crawl which is also not what I want to do. Um, now, granted, going on land defeats the Swagans' advantage of being in the water, but it's still a heavily guarded post. The other problem with level one, I'm going to zoom out for a second so you can see. There's nothing in this fucking map. <laughs> Eric, you should make your own dungeon. Shut up. There's nothing going on in almost the entire first level. What the hell? How is this a classic like successful dungeon crawl i don't understand it's all empty what is going on am i crazy now look i get i get the you know we don't have to fill every room with something or and certainly not fill it all with enemies but i really like using the one third rule where like one third of rooms should probably have enemies in it or some kind of combat one third of rooms should have just some kind of interactivity for the players whether that's treasures or a secret door or uh, loot that they can find, or a trap that's put in there, or a combination of all those things. And then another third of the rooms can probably be empty, but even then the empty, you know, should have maybe some kind of lore stuff to look at, or, you know, something going on. I'm not getting, like, any kind of stuff from that here. Like, there's just nothing going on. If we count, there's that big battle in the first room. There's, like, two more Sawag in here, which, again, are kind of designed to just run away and warn the entire rest of the party. And then I think we count, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine rooms in a row with nothing in them but maybe minor loot. Like you can find standard weapons. One of them might have something i don't know it's just like tools like there's no even loot okay so there's nine rooms in a row completely fucking empty right everything is just kind of under construction and, and i get it the swagan wouldn't really be up here much because they're all down in the lower levels because they like being in the water that makes sense but like you gotta fucking make it interesting it's just not very interesting if the players just walk around this level i don't know so somebody who's run this please let me know how you did this because this looks like a slog in the in a in a in a boring way. So nine empty rooms in a row of nothing going on. Then you've got a guard post in room twelve, which is down here, which has the 
Uh, similar Sawagan makeup. Five Sawagan, two Coral Smashers. This time Coral Priestesses occupy this room. Unless they were called to help in areas one and two. So they are the reinforcements that come and bolster so you can turn into just a huge back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back fight if they come in and help defeat the others. Otherwise, they're just sitting here guarding this other area. Although there are ways it looks like to completely avoid them if you want to. If you go around into more empty rooms, you can just avoid this guard post completely. So they're not. it's not like it's a whole other checkpoint system or something there. Uh, they even have a gate behind them, but again, you can get around, it looks, according to this map, you can get around this gate, so I don't know. Um, Area 13 does have a, a dying human slave named Elmo. Clearly this was written before the 90s, uh, <laughs> because you don't really have characters named Elmo anymore. Uh, who I guess could provide some helpful context, although he's kind of got limited information and he's designed to die after the party speak with him, but at least there's something that's that, that counts as an interactivity, at least in that one room. Uh, we've got another one, two, two rooms with nothing in it. And then the larder has some loot, maybe the final members of Elmo's party as a bunch of adventure corpses. Uh, maybe not even, nope, there's not, there was no loot. Even the organs were carefully removed. The carcasses include eels, dwarf, human, lizard folk. Okay, so some interactive... This is the example of like a lore-based room, right? There's there's nothing really for the party to get, but they can at least learn information. So it's a better kind of empty room in Area 16. Then we've got a... Ooh, a glyph. Okay, we've got a trap room. That's great. Area 17. Uh, what is that trap room? Uh, block off. It blocks off a secret room which has a treasure, a cloak of the manta ray, a suit of mithril armor, and a suit of normal uh, chainmail, three normal shields, and 12 potions of water breathing. Okay, so that's a great find in the very far corner of the dungeon after finding a secret door and surviving a trap. So that's better. And then we've got this final, the actual stairs that go under is also full of bad guys, which is cool. And then a bunch of like slaves working at like... Um, I guess breaking out the area or yet yeah, uh, finish to the satisfaction of the Sawagan before the level is flooded. So this first level is a mess because I feel like you would just montage the players through at least these first, what is supposed to be like nine rooms before they can choose to either go this direction and not fuck around with the guard post or go to the guard post and then they have to go to the stairs down. So I'm not I'm not liking this first level. So I'm thinking maybe if we infiltrate on level three, and I think a lot of the bosses are on level two, we could possibly just get away with not even doing level one. Other than level one, maybe it could be an escape path for the party, right? They could like make their way up the level and then uh, not have to deal with being underwater anymore and escape out that way. But I don't... I don't like this entire first level, basically. I, it just feels like it needs to be half the size and needs to be more active. Whatever's going on in area, this final area, uh, level 19, needs to be done in like multiple rooms. I think that's how you make it more interesting. Find a bunch of slaves like shackled up um, and like working at restoring things and a few like just guards and sawagan everywhere and like make it so this whole area is under construction, not just kind of weirdly empty. Smooth and dressed the exterior walls, the hall, slave is shackled to the ankle with a length of chain and wears a metal collar. Several sawagan oversee the slaves as they work while others rest and chat near the top of the stairs. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Colored tiles awaiting placement. They're literally like floor, like putting new flooring. <laughs> Sound of lapping watery and stone can be heard coming from the bottom of the stairs. That literally goes down into the water, which are the sunken levels. Yeah, stairs descended to area 20. Water from the flooded levels laps the second step from the top of the stairs. And the stairs submerges the party in cold, but not frigid seawater. And the Swaggin Champion has a pair of gold and silver armbands, which is a little bit of loot. I don't know, man. My party actually entered the main door at Area 1. They were not subtle. They walked over the causeway and Misty stepped inside and unbarred it, letting the others in. Yeah, that would, that would work, I guess, but don't they immediately have to fight all those enemies? Or they, were they able to distract them or or, or roll a deception or per, persuasion check to allow these Zawagan to let them in, which seems absolutely bananas to me. And also, 
again, things are the situation is different in my campaign versus a standard Ghost of Saltmarsh campaigns. That's also partly what we're having to work with here, right? Like they're being motivated and somewhat controlled by the mind flayers for that whole context, rather than just being like, you know, Sawagin with a cause or something. This this time I, they're kind of almost supernaturally empowered. So some really have disadvantage on elemental underwater, like a warhammer. Uh, so the weird thing is, Michael, you have dis yes, the underwater combat. You have disadvantage on most weapons except for a certain couple. If you don't have a swim speed, apparently, if you do have a swim speed, I don't think any of the underwater combat rules actually apply to you. But it is interesting that even though a character may be able to breathe underwater, they may not necessarily have a swim speed. Uh, in which case, you would have those restrictions and limitations on which uh, weapons that you could use, but I, I believe for all creatures that have a swim speed, they can actually just use whatever weapon, but it just feels weird to like wield a war hammer, like that's specifically like, like force really. I don't know. I feel like you could get more exotic with it, right? Couldn't we do something like, I don't know. What's a, what's an underwater creature, like a tentacle whip or a pincher or something that would be more like coral themed versus the swagon having just regular weapons or would they still be in that room maybe they've been patrolling around making it possible to explore the dungeon stealthily uh yeah i mean i definitely want to have them be able to explore the dungeon stealthily and walking around but i still don't want to have just a bunch of emptiness the map is also set up as an outpost before the main swagon forces arrive to occupy it added patrols to make it more interesting okay that's an idea i think i also had a slave who had escaped but not able to get out in one of the barren rooms that's also a better idea Yeah, um, take it out of content, yeah. <laughs> Very true. Um, yeah, these are all good ideas to make to make level one more interesting. I'm not sure we're even going to get to level one because I, I, I'm all of this is basically motivating me to uh, tell the players through the lizard folk that they will meet with, the ones who were here, and that is designed in the actual adventure under the Council of War section where like they, they have this big meeting with the lizard folk, the merfolk, and apparently Lokath, um, where they can meet with the council and the players are basically just sent to do some reconnaissance missions. But I believe the lizard folk are, uh, you should give players information about the former lizard folk layer in the surrounding area, including but not limited to the following details. The layer is a three cave system inside a rocky island. The island seems to have sunk into the surrounding area, leaving only the top one third visible. The main entrance is now a large cave that faces the sea coast. And the lizard folk made a few changes to the place, only adding stairs to connect the levels. Oh, the lizard folk made changes, okay. Oh, but then it says the Sawagan have made drastic changes to the former layer. Beyond submerging the two lower levels beneath the water, all the alterations layer made by the Sawagan are described in the Sawagan stronghold, which I take it as being the discrepancy between what the lizard folk show uh, on their map versus what the Sawagan have done. So that's why the, the two, which I like the fact that there's a heist, you get your like heist floor plan map, but it's not updated. So you, you don't have like, you, you have some information, but not all the information. I do like that part of it. So I want to keep the meeting sort of, but just focus on the lizard folks specifically. I don't feel and, and use and use them as the ones who are capable of like maybe launching at least some kind of distracting attack. I don't the bad thing is I don't know if the lizard folk would have the capability um of I'm I'm really making the Sawagan, I guess, more powerful and more organized and more dangerous in my campaign in the fact that they like own the sea right here. So any kind of distracting attack, like I'm not actually sure how any other factions would be able to pull it off and the party are the ones with the ship so they might have to do a dangerous thing we're like okay use our powerful ship the bad thing is i can't force the party to do anything <laughs> that's the real problem with dnd is i can't force the party to do what i want them to do <laughs> um i i feel like if i were writing this as a story the party would then say okay you lizard folk like you're your most badasses of the badasses, you will all be on the ship together. But then we will take our small, sh our small like rowboat or something, or just put on our special swimming gear that we have, 
and sink down to the water. And in, like you guys use the ship to provide the distraction because we already know it's a big target and goes after it. And we'll go down into the water while you guys are being a distraction. That's a huge risk because they're like, here's our fancy ship we've upgraded and everything. It's our only ship. And we're giving it to these guys we just met. They'll still have their own crew on there, like their, uh, you know, NPC allies. But that's that's how I would do it if I were writing this as a story. It would make sense to me. But I'm sure they will come up with some other insane plan that involves them, like, just ramming their fucking ship into the dungeon or something crazy. But I, I do want to paint the fact that, like, you can't normally get near this place. And, in fact, the Swag have done a good job of just shutting down and destroying all... Uh, trade in the area all ships in the area and that's something that we will uh introduce uh we, we will reflect via a opening battle which we can get into that for the final uh, part of this crafting stream um i think it's this ship encounters one yeah so we're just going to use the same battle map i've used for their previous battles they've had while on their ship maybe combine that with the floating debris uh encounter that we actually rolled so many times ago where the uh, party will, as they get close, basically they won't have anything for like three or four days. And then as they get close to the Swagan Lair and the Thornhold area, they will see like the remains of a destroyed ship. Uh, maybe even like some bodies floating in the water and hopefully get them to like slow down and check it out. Otherwise we might have to change our encounter slightly. And then as they do that, we'll have a Swagan force uh, come onto the ship and uh, essentially try to take them down like they would any other ship. But of course, the Swagan, maybe these ones don't necessarily, uh, maybe the party has gotten a reputation by now, but they wouldn't necessarily recognize the ship just yet or whatever reason they're kind of coming in and trying to take them out. And then obviously they'll get their asses kicked, I believe. But then still the party should know that like, oh, uh, maybe there's like, they see more Swagan in the distance or, or something to the fact that um, it's just, it's not very safe to be in these waters. And I, I, I like the idea of using the Coral Smashers specifically. It's, uh, they also have some neat, uh, different token art, which is cool. As, you know, it says they're siege monsters, right? They deal double damage to objects and structures. Well, maybe it's literally that they have like this whole tactical plan where the Sawagan climb, the regular Sawagan climb up the ship and these Coral Smashers actually just swim up to the side of the ship and just start beating the shit out of your ship because, they know to take advantage of being in the water, they need to put everybody else in the water and they just destroy your ship rather than just climb aboard and try to take everybody out that way. Instead, they'll do both of them. So it's kind of a two-pronged attack. So again, this is something that makes the Swagon a lot more dangerous to deal with and menacing and, and makes them so effective that they can just destroy the ship right out. In fact, maybe I could even paint the facts, and I think it says in Call from the Deep that the Sawagan should... Oh, what is that under? Uh, the Sawagan should have like weapons and equipment that look like they're from the mind flayers or something let's see if that's under what is that under i think i read that somewhere and i could maybe do that like maybe their siege weapons are like specifically created from the mind flayer stuff let's see under swagan uh sea devils must serve by the influence of zox four swagan little do a slark with but since discovery the nautiloid crash things have changed pieces of strange mind flayer technology have made their way into the hands of the Swagan, who have distributed it throughout their tribes for the influence of the Elder Brain. The Sea Devils may carry them spears made of strange metal, foreign tablets with Qualish inscriptions, or even weapons created by the Illithid for them. So maybe I can look up, I think they talk about having flincing claws or something. Maybe they've got some kind of these crazy, unique, like, Illithid-powered weapon. I know previously we talked about, like, biological stuff that they were doing to the humans, but maybe to the Swagan... Uh, the captured humans, and that's how they created the sea spawn. Maybe to the Swagan, they were just empowering them with some more powerful weapons. I didn't reflect that in Wreck of the Golden Crown, which I probably should have. Um, but oh well. <laughs> Maybe it's just these are different stat blocks, and these guys have these specific whatever I can replace a Warhammer with that would make sense for water and could be some kind of weird, like alien technology that allows them to uh, kind of punch holes in the ships and do some real damage. So. I think that would make this this particular encounter a little more scary and interesting versus literally just having a couple Swag and like climb aboard and then get blasted off by, you know, Toral and shoved off by Gotwald. I still, you know, they still want to do that. I'm going to let them do that because that's fun for the players. But then I make things a little more tense by having their whole ship suddenly get like, you know, rocking around and and bashed and stuff. Uh, 
because of these uh, coral smashers who were in the water. So I, I changed the encounter a little bit from the standard patrol, I believe is five Sawagan, one smasher and one champion. I kept the five Sawagan, kept the champion, but I'm I'm making it four coral smashers. So each of them like jump up. And it's really like a planned thing they do. Each of them get on a different corner of the ship and just start bashing it and doing damage uh, to the ship to kind of prove that, you know, they know what they're doing and it's a dangerous place for ships to be around here. But somehow also reflect the fact that it's the party can't really and they don't even really probably know where it is either. Because I think in Red Rocks, there's just shit everywhere. Let's see, where's the location? And I think you even have to make a save to get through it. Let's see. Because I, I was going to play. Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm placing this Wagon Stronghold in the Red Rocks region of... Forgotten Realms. Red Rock has sunk countless ships over the centuries. Uh, characters sail through the rocks in a ship that require more than two crew members run the risk of scuppering their ship. The crew must succeed on DC 16 group dexterity check. Not sure how you... Uh, that's kind of weird with your on a ship together and you all have to make the dex check. Failure causes the ship smashing against the rocks, taking 5d10 bludgeoning damage, which is enough to do some damage to the ship. And it talks about an encounter with Merfolk that I'm not going to use, but instead it'll be an encounter with uh, Sawagin, I believe. Also, I'm thinking of... Oh, here's a suggested encounter. Vessels that come through much are spied by the Merfolk. Oh, and a giant shark, yeah. So the giant shark will be from... Uh, we can use that with the Sawagin. And that's something where if they like think they can keep going in Red Rocks, they'll, they'll see like giant shark in the distance and Sawagin and just a whole patrol of things going on and then if nobody suggests it then the triton ally will definitely be like hey let's go pull into thornhold here that's where i last heard there was a safe place and that's where their safe dock is going to be and that's it's literally just there to be a safe zone for them to park their ship and kind of talk to folks about what's going on but there will be this single uh dangerous encounter basically that's lined up to already do damage to their ship although i'm sure you know they got the ballista they got the ram i know they want to do things with the ship um and, and, and again, maybe they'll maybe they'll suggest something to the fact that like, well, we'll provide the distraction, we'll do a bunch of things. I, I don't know. We'll we'll have to see. I I don't have a good way of letting them use their tools uh, at the moment, and certainly don't have don't have it planned where they just battle an endless wave of swagging. But I, I need to paint the fact that there's just too many out there, and it's going to be too dangerous, and you're basically stirring up the hornet's nest of this entire dungeon, and you need to go in and kind of get your bearings and come up with a different uh, plan. And instead of just going in willy nilly trying to find where this place is, but uh, we could add something to do with the fact that Red Rocks is a very dangerous area, especially if you don't know where you're going. Uh, you know, maybe they'll have to take like one of the lizard folk from the tribe with them, uh, which by the way, I, I talked to he Heather about it and she uh, was not interested in having any ties to this lizard folk tribe either. So I don't have to worry about having her know any other information or something. So once they get to the lizard folk, they can meet with them and uh, maybe one of them can help their ship navigate through the Red Rocks area, but that would also give a big advantage to the Swagon and hopefully help deter the party from just taking their ship and, and going through there. Warlock of the Great Older Milling, a plus two rod of the Pact Keeper. Specifically for Warlocks. I can't even imagine giving Toral more power at this point. <laughs> plus two bonus to spell attack rolls and to the saving throw DCs of your Warlock spells. Wow. Regain one Warlock spell slot as an action while holding the rod. You can't use this property again until you finish Long Rest. Jeez, that's powerful. That's just from a random encounter it suggests in Red Rocks, too. That's nuts. Oh, yeah, for sure. We got to have uh, one of the net guys. <laughs> that's how you make it in the Swagan hierarchy, right? You got to have the net. I don't think the champions have nets, though. And uh, the, the Swagan Raiders I was using is specifically from Call from the Deep, interestingly enough which means they don't appear normally in uh, the final enemy, even though there are a ton of interesting Sawagan stat blocks here. I don't think any of them... So the only ones that were, are used so far that I've seen are Quarrel Smasher and Champion. I haven't seen... Or I guess High Priestess. I think High Priestess is in the standard monster manual too. Uh, we've got a few other ones. Hatchling Swarm. Oh, it's like Baby Sawagan. Yeah, dangerous to any creatures they encounter. Yikes. 
Uh, there's also a Deep Diver, a Blade Master, and a Wave Shaper. Uh, in addition to, I assume, a regular Baron, right? I guess Baron is... I wonder why the Baron's not in here. Because isn't the, isn't the Baron uh, the actual boss of the area? Also, for level 2 purposes, which they will need to get to because one of the missions will be to take out the leadership of the Swagon. Um, I don't know if those are going to be able to tell them they're on level 2, though. Is there is a creature... Oh, maybe it's under named creatures. Nope, it's not. It's only Kish and the Maw of Sekla. But the Maw of Sekla is what I'm getting to. So again, in, in OG Ghost of Saltmarsh, the Swagon are their own force. They're very dangerous. So you fight this like personification of their god, which is a two-headed shark. Now, a two-headed shark sounds really cool on paper. But when you really think about it and you look at the picture, I, I think it's kind of dumb. <laughs> I'll be honest. I think it's kind of dumb. Uh, it, like a two-headed shark. I don't know, man. It's, it's dumb. A uh, huge monstrosity. It's a CR7. Uh, not necessarily the final boss, just one of the... It, it, it's, it's an interesting dungeon structure, right? It doesn't have a typical, like, oh, you're going your way through and there's a final boss fight. I don't know where that's... The final boss could be the Baron. It could be the Priestess. It could be this Maw of Sekula. I have no idea. It does have legendary resistance and legendary actions. But I'm thinking because the Mind Flayer, because specifically these Sawagan are so powerful because of the Mind Flayer influence uh, and the control they have over them, maybe we should replace the Maw of Sekula with a Illithid type creature. Uh, so we've got a few minutes left in crafting. If you have any thoughts or comments on or ideas, for replacing the Maw of Sekula, unless you really attach this creature, but I'm thinking we can use something a bit more alien and otherworldly. I don't really want to go like Abolith or Kraken, because obviously those are used in different areas. Um, but maybe, I was thinking maybe like a Neolithid or something. I'd have to look at the CR value and the overall strength of something. And, and I could always take something and obviously modify it. Uh, I don't know if I can just search for, you know, unfortunately the filter system is limited by like source or type. I guess like monstrosity would be something I could, but that's still a pretty big uh, category. Uh, I was thinking Neo, I think I used Neolithid though, didn't I? I used the artwork at least uh, at the end of Rhyme, but that's kind of a cool creature. Obviously it would have to be, whatever I use would have to be converted to be an underwater creature. Okay, this thing's a lot stronger than I was thinking, CR 13, but it's got tentacles. <laughs> so that's the other thing is it would have to make sense for it to be under, it'd have to be an underwater creature that that would be that would make sense that the like illithids would be able to create it or bestow upon the Sawagan as some kind of manifestation of their force or their control. Uh, you know, may, maybe I can expand it to make it so. The, the only thing I didn't necessarily want to do here is is put one of the mind mind flayer generals themselves in here, and because instead I really want them to be like, no, the Sawagan got this. We'll just influence them through other ways versus other areas like the Bronzo Mine and then and then the Styes. They will have a direct Mind Flare general there. But for here, I was thinking, you know, there's enough leadership and bosses here. I don't think I want to put a Mind Flare uh, here. And also, I'm not sure if Mind Flayers can breathe underwater. And yet, I know there's some in Escarl, so I'm not sure how that works for it. A Super Chul. You know what? Uh, there are. I think Monster Man Expanded has different kinds of tools. James suggests a star spawn. Uh, which, for some reason, doesn't have a lot of good artwork on here. Ooh, the Mangler. I think I used that with the design thing, didn't I? Use one of those tokens. Not a swimming creature. It's a climbing creature for that one. Maybe different kinds of star spawn. Why do they not have artwork, though? That's disappointing. Larva Mage. There's a regular. There's a Star Spawn Hulk. Psychic damage is a good thing to look for. Psychic Mirror is good. It's arms. I'm a little disappointed we're not getting enough artwork though from here. Amphibious means no safe place. Yeah, it needs to be. It doesn't have to have it built in, but at least from the concept of the creature, it needs to make sense that it could swim and I could always modify it to add a swim thing on there. This is it. Yeah, the the chul. So I think a base chul is actually pretty strong, right? CR 4 or 5 maybe. 
Yeah, CR4. Uh, so you might be able to just take a Chul and give it... Le so the main thing is the Maw has legendary actions and legendary resistance. Uh, it's 100 hit, 100 hit points with a bite and tail smash, and obviously it swims to 50 feet. Chul already has a swim speed also, which is good. Makes sense for water. Looks creepy. Kind of liking the Chul angle, uh, Nate. Pincher and tentacles that can paralyze. And then Monster Man Expanded gives us the Chul Juggernaut and the Uchulon. Which, uh, what is this? Slime Chul? Yeah, Paralytic Slime. It's a CR7, which is better because I think the Maw was a CR7, right? Tentacles. Ooh, this one has the Mind... This one straight up has the Mind Flayer Mind Blast. Oh, shit. This is literally Mind Flayers capture and enslave Chul Service Guardians. They implant Chuls with Illithid Tadpoles. This is literally a Mind Flayer to Chul. Well, fuck. Monster Man Expanded may have exactly what I need then. Wait, Uchulon is in Call from the Deep? What? That's already used somewhere? Where is it used? Shit. Did we just have a great minds think alike, JVC Perry? Where is... Did you already use this creature? Uh, where's creatures at? Creatures... You, it is here, or maybe I already put it in here. Let's see, Uchalon. It is already here. Oh, fascinating! Didn't have the artwork. Uh, is it the same character sheet? That's hilarious. No, it's definitely not. Cause it's CR four. Is a chul implanted with an illithid tadpole? Yeah. That's hilarious. Okay. Uh, it's not the same stat block, though. The one from Monster Man Expanded is a lot stronger and has the Mind Blast. The one thing in common is they both have the Paralyzing Slime. This must be a creature from an older edition or something that they both got this similar idea from, though. Uh, but according to the, the locations, it doesn't appear until the final dungeon in Ascarl, and then this thing called Lotharl's Lantern. I assume that's just a random encounter somewhere. Huh. Okay, but I think that could be... We could turn that... I, I like the Monster Man Expanded version better because it's a little stronger. Uh, although maybe it's too strong if I then add... The legendary actions on top of it. So we may take this and modify, but I could see I could see changing the Maw of Sekalot, which again I know is a major fun part of this dungeon because it's the cool big exotic creature, but into this tie into this creature, and that helps again flavor the fact that the Sawagan have been like corrupted and are being maybe not directly controlled, but like, you know, subtly inspired by and motivated by the Illithids. Uh, to continue their work, and the reason they're so powerful and strong is because of the Illithid influence, so that would be a big creature to replace. And I think it's in, like, the middle of level 2 or something, so I like that design. All right, I think that's going to do it for this crafting stream. Um, a, a lot of what we're actually going to do, I think, tomorrow is not what we talked about here. Instead, we're going to do this ship encounter, and then I did... Uh, shoot, where's that map? I did pull together a, a quick swamp map with those katablibas things. Uh, I think using those is still a fine idea. I may modify this encounter a little bit, but I, I basically just want the party to come across the lizard folk and have a little bit of a fun uh, throw down with uh, some swamp creatures before they actually meet with them. Uh, and and I think I'm leaning towards letting the players actually save the lizard folk from a nasty encounter that just shows that lizard folk are in bad shape being in the swamp. They don't want to be here. They want to get their home back. So I think we'll get through uh, the level up, the... Uh, Sawagan ship encounter, docking into Thornhold and talking with those folks briefly, and then getting out to the swamp, and then maybe depending on how long the level up takes, getting through this common encounter or maybe not, and maybe uh, what ideally I'd like to end it with them probably ending this combat encounter and then talking to the lizard folk after that, and then I really wouldn't have a problem with them if they even wanted a long rest back at Thornhold. I think I'd probably be okay with that before taking on this huge dungeon, depending on. Uh, what they 
depending on how many resources I guess they burn through. Oops, it's this one. Uh, because they're not on a huge time constraint at that point. Because, uh, yeah, so Thornhold will be their kind of safe base of operations as they go out to the Swag and Stronghold. So we'll still have, thankfully, more sessions to talk about the Swag and Stronghold because, yeah, it's a bit of a mess and is going to take some work. Uh, thank you to everyone for watching this week's uh, or this Thursday edition of Crafting the Deep. If you enjoy the content, do check out patreon.com slash Rogue Watson, shouts to Platinum Patrons, Joe, Will, Thomas, Stan, Brennan, Zenicider, Eclectic, Roleplay, Roll, Christopher, Corey, Big Nut, John, F, John, L, Eric, Tyler, Nathan, Camp, Crystal, Lake, Counselor, Andrew, Dell, Laurel, John, Captain, Woody, 79, Stephanie, Andy, Patrick, Jason, Ismail, Amit, Lumpy's Buds, Sharni, David, and William. Gold Patrons, RPG, Paper, Crimes, Pretty Boy, and Yuma, Dead Lizard, Lion, Sam, Jerome, Nathan, Fast, Like a Tortoise, Scott, Rufus, Carolyn, Jerry, Glenn, Marcus, and Mark. Thank you all very much for your support. I will see you for D&D &D tomorrow night. The full party, hopefully, uh, back in action.